to The Mary Mack Show, where we will be talking about your feelings, experiences, and pain following the death of a loved one. Thank you for joining us today on The Mary Mack Show, where we speak with Merica Cole about her uh, investigating the murder of her son to what she thought was fentanyl, but actually became car fentanyl, which is a hundred times more potent than fentanyl. So let's join her as she talks about that now. Time stood still for me, and I thought, the first thing I thought is I, I need to pray. I need to pray for wisdom. I need to pray for courage. I need to pray for um, peace, however I could get it right now, because I can't. This is my second child. And um, we were all at a loss, like what just happened here. Sure. So... We get home and the boys are there. Um, my son flew in from Germany. He's my oldest son. He's in the army. Mm -hmm. He flew in from Germany at the time he was in Germany and he knew that he had to be there. So he said, my mom, my brother passed away. I need to go. So they paid for his flight to get here. He got here pretty quickly. And... <clears throat> Now, my oldest son um, is definitely on the spectrum for sure. And, but his, his empathy, I, I will tell you his empathy kicked in where normally he doesn't have that empathy built in mm -hmm. to him. It's everything's a learned behavior. And it was difficult for him to process, difficult for him to cry, difficult for my husband to cry. Um, and here I am bawling, you know, like, what's wrong with everyone? Aren't you sad? You know, that type of thing. And um, it was devastating. It was just devastating. And the first thing I said was something happened. I need to get into his phone. I need to find out what happened. And this is what drug-induced homicide promotes because to secure an investigation, you go to the sources of finding out what happened so that you can rule out homicide. You can rule out and find out what happened. Um, so I called the police and I said, hey, I noticed you guys haven't been here, but he died in his room. Can someone come out and take a look? Ma'am, this was an overdose. The police department came and they said that there was paraphernalia by him and that it was an overdose. Well, I was there and I'm looking around, I'm trying to figure out what happened. So I know that wasn't factual. And um, I said, can you please come out? And I didn't want to say, you don't know what you're talking about. I didn't want to yeah. go into attack mode because that's not how you get things done and completed. So I had to calm down as much as I could. I was still crying. And I had to calm down and say, look, you know, there needs to be an investigation. Something happened. And I, I just don't know what. And they said, basically, it's an overdose. And that's how we're calling it. There's no, there's not going to be an investigation. And they shut it down in the very beginning. So here I was victimized again mm -hmm. by somebody who wasn't listening to my concerns. Um, or paying attention to my concerns. I felt that the police are supposed to protect and serve, and I didn't get that um, feeling of an investigation could have, even if it, it, no matter which way the investigation goes, at least there was an investigation. 
And um, so I was forced to investigate my own son's death, which was a travesty to relive what happened to him. So the first thing I knew that he's very concrete, that he doesn't deviate from his thoughts. He's, he's pretty much routine. And I thought, I'm going to try to get into his phone. And I was right on the third guess. I got into his phone and I realized where he went, what had happened, that somebody had his cash app card and a cash app card is like a card that's associated. If I put money into account, he can have a card and use that card. And somebody had it. And I realized that somebody ordered Amazon food where they deliver food, Okay. food delivery. So I had to take the steps of giving Amazon my um, conservatorship papers, showing that it's okay to tell me about his finances because I'm his conservatorship over finances, medical, all that. And they gave me the address and it was this person that he had visited. We found out where he went to. It was that person's girlfriend had Mary's cash out card and was ordering things. Wow. They had gotten gas one time. They ordered food and didn't know that he had passed away because it was new it just happened and um my boys of course were with me you know because we're still grieving and i said i know where his cash out card is we need to go get it and my boys went over there and they were very offensive they were very offended that we would ask for his cash out card and he said, it belongs to my brother. And why are you offended? And he said, if there's anything else that you have of his, you might want to give it to me. And they did not want to give it up until my boys revealed to them that he had died. And they were like, you know, shocked and started handing things over. And that was unbelievable. And her father picked her up. He lives in another part of California picked her up and took him, oh, took her away from, so that she couldn't be questioned, you know, yeah. um, that's, that's what I'm thinking. I didn't tell them that the officer told me there would be no investigation. I didn't say anything about it. Right. That's the first that they learned that Merrick had passed that it, and it went around the street, like wildfire. Did you know that he passed? Did you know that he passed? Um, and the reason why we didn't write an obituary, a lot of people asked, how come you didn't write an obituary? Because I didn't know what happened to him. And I didn't want whoever it was to know. And that was critical. Um, all these months of not getting an investigation. Um, and I thought, do I put that out there? And I didn't want to do that as his conservator to try to get answers for the conservatorship court. What happened? I don't want to impede on somebody running because they found out that he had died. Right. right. So I, I did not do an obituary. And um, I, I have a lot of Facebook friends that heard about what happened and they raised enough money to bury him. In two and a half weeks, he was buried. And um, Facebook and social media, when you're a kind person, I'm, I'm learning this, when you're a kind person, and I was helping people because I lost Mario, you know, about the grieving process at that time, had learned to, they got to know me really good, and um, they were raising money um, from all over the United States and sending it into the funeral home or to Venmo. And I would get receipts and show them that it's where it's going because I wanted to be way above board and over and beyond showing right. them my gratitude. So um, I'm just grateful 
for the communication that I did have with people at the time. And I wasn't afraid to talk about my son and how I felt as, as a grieving mom. I was still grieving after three, four, five years, you know, um, the pain just doesn't go away when you leave a child, when, when a child leaves you, um, the hurt, the grief is always there. Um, but how we manage that is a whole different process. Yes. So, um, with Merrick, we, I learned a lot about what happened to him. I learned a lot about, um, how they took advantage financially. I brought it to their, you know, the authorities attention. And sometimes it takes the change of a detective, one detective to, or a second look by somebody else to realize that something was amiss and this should have never been deemed as, as an overdose. And I just learned that um, about two months ago, that there's a new task force and that they're looking into it and taking a second look at this because with his autism and the fact of the cash out card and the fact that he said he was going to die, the writing that I have from the person that knows our family, they this person knows our family um, that gave it to Merrick that had it in his house. Um, he said, I had it. I had carfentanil and it was on the table and he admitted it was enough to kill a person. He put it in writing. It was enough to kill a person. I'm so sorry that this happened. And he told me days before that, you know, he was being threatened and it took a second set of eyes to realize what I had been saying all that time that we, we already know they just need to be questioned and pulled in to get the answers. Um, I was able to recover his true religion clothes, his shoes. He has little expensive baseball hats. I, these baseball hats are Thirty dollars on it, and <laughs> uh, they—they're incredibly expensive. But he would never just give them away, and they had his hats. Wow. They had his. Remember, I told you he took off on a skateboard. He yes. he went to a. He didn't return on a skateboard. I looked later on the cameras, and he came back on a bicycle that wasn't his. Oh my! Because they had taken his skateboard. Um, I recovered his skateboard. Um, and for someone to financially take advantage for the whole year prior, because what this old investigator or the original investigator was doing was looking at the day that it happened, what happened financially. And I said, this had been going on for a while and he had things to give them. They were threatening him. And when homeless people have nothing, they will do whatever they can to get whatever they want. They can sell the hats and buy their drugs. They can sell sure. the shirts and buy their drugs. They can sell his skateboard and buy their drugs. Right. And um, not only were they taking his things, but the cash app transactions, I printed them all out and they were going to the two homeless people and the gentleman that said, I'm sorry, and his girlfriend, it, the money was just going to the four main sources. And I was thinking, this is a financial, it should be an enhancement because he had a disability and they took total advantage of him. And when he ran out toward the end of his life, um, I could tell where I had said, hey, you know, that's a lot of money. Let me just pull back, you know, let me just give him less. If he wants to go to Jack in the Box, I'll give him whatever he needs to go. And a little bit more because you don't want to be so, well, this much for a burger and that's what you're going to get. I wasn't like that. I was like, okay, if you're going to go to Jack in the Box, 15 bucks and it'll give him time. If he wants to get soda, he can. If he wants to 
you know, go to, a, you know, there's a convenience store next to it and he can get chips. Um, he did that a lot. And for them to deplete everything that he had and he started handing over things and items and when he I didn't even realize it because I don't go through his room after he passed away I realized he didn't have anything of value in his room and that was his whole world was his room his safe place he had his things that he could mess around with he had his earphones that autistic people always love to wear earphones because it drowns out all the stress and feeling that they have um it drowns out um so much for him and he would never give that up and i couldn't even find one set of headphones his bluetooth speaker in his bathroom where he likes to listen to music as he's brushing his teeth <laughs> that was gone a lot of stuff was gone and and i thought then i got angry and i remember i'm the type of mom i would buy him something and i would take a picture i'm like hey guess what i got what color do you want this or this and i would take pictures or because he didn't, sometimes he just didn't want to go to the mall. He didn't want to go. He just wanted to stay home. Mm -hmm. So when I got him these true religion shoes, he was at a friend's house. He was playing video games with a friend. And I took a picture of the shoes and I said, Hey, have you liked them apples? You know, that <laughs> type of thing. Mom, I want to come home. You know, then he, you know, he'd come home and I'd feel better because, you know, he's home. Um, but in all honesty, in his situation, I always feared because um, child traffic is, trafficking is so prevalent and it's really bad in Sacramento. I thought for sure somebody was going to snatch him because he's so vulnerable. And then he asked me, mom, if you get me a motorized skateboard, then nobody can snatch me. I can ride fast, you know, and so I thought, it gives him a chance. I can't keep him home. You know, it, that would be wrong. And that's abuse of um, conservatorship is that being that controlling. So I got him the skateboard and I said, you know what, practice it right here in the court. Don't take it out on the street. I want to make sure that you can handle this skateboard. It went up to 20 miles an hour. I didn't know that until <laughs> he told me, Mom, did you know that it goes about 20 miles an hour? Um, but yeah, they took a skateboard and oh, my um, goodness. he came back on a bicycle and, um, you know, they, they were just depleting him where he didn't have anything. And that's when they were throwing threats, you know, to him. We'll do this to you. We'll do that to you. He didn't have anything to give to them. So one of his friends who has autism, they do attract each other. One of his friends that has autism that lives right around the corner from us said, um, hey, I miss Merrick. He said, and he had so much anxiety. I said, are you okay? And he said, yeah, I just miss him. Can I pet his dog? Aww. So um, <laughs> he moved he pet his dog. And he said, you know, I wish I would have been there at least a week before he passed because all he was trying to do is get his stuff. And I found out that he was banging on the door and wanting his stuff and was being very loud, very disruptive as autistic people. Once they get a fight or flight type of uh, mentality, wanting his stuff in his friend revealed that he was trying to get his stuff and um i really truly believe that because i know my son you know i need my stuff because my mom's gonna find out boy is she gonna be mad that type of you know thing oh you're gonna you're gonna have to deal with my mom you know mm -hmm. and i remember getting a phone call from the boy about a month prior 
he said, hey, Merrick's outside banging on my door. Can you call him? He needs to go home because there's two people here that have warrants and we can't have that over here. I didn't even know that. And so I said, give the phone to him. And he gave him the phone. I said, Merrick, what are you doing? You can't bang on people's doors like that. Come home. And he says, mom, oh, okay. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll come home. And he threw the phone at his, the guy and came home because he does listen. He listens when I tell him to do something. And I'm like, you can't be banging on people's doors like that. I talked to him when he came home, but he never told me that they had his stuff because he thought I'd be mad mm -hmm. and very upset. So he never told me. Um, but his friend revealed it when he came over to pet his dog. And he said, if I would have just been with him, um, he would have been able to get some of his stuff. And then it justified my mind that I was right. They, he was trying to get his stuff and it's sad to even think that because he has older brothers, um, the girlfriend revealed to me after the two broke up after Merrick died, she befriended me and said, I was trying to tell Merrick to tell his brothers because they could get his stuff back for him. Right. Well, I have, they're older. They're much older. And they're very afraid of my boys because if they, you know, have to get involved, they're like, why do you have my brother's stuff? Yeah. You know? So um, I think in their mind, because remember they're, they, they have addiction issues and um, with addiction issues comes paranoia and all kinds of other things that they felt like if we give him this, then he can't tell his brothers. Right. And I, I truly believe that that's what happened, that he was a casualty of just wanting to get his things back. And now they realize how devastating and what a bad decision that was. But they they need to um, be held accountable for their actions. They need to be held accountable finally for, for what has happened you know, and it's up to the police to find out what took place, who we know who had it. And if the other two were involved, then that comes out in what we call an investigation. So um, all this time, I thought, you know, if we would have just had this investigation in the very beginning, we wouldn't, I would, I would have way less grief and, um, I don't know. I just think that Merrick was failed on a, a lot of levels. Um, I had him in therapy, which he loved to go. Um, he got to know his therapist. Once he knows someone really good, he's, that's it. That's my friend, you know? <laughs> and, um, and that played a lot of danger in his life because a lot of people, if he didn't know them and they said, Hey, you know, he goes, that's my friend, you know, and if you don't know their real name or their last name, they're not friends. So um, he used to hang out with a guy named Slim. That was his nickname. Oh my goodness. And he says, that's, and I had to bring it to his attention that what's his real name? He goes, mom, I don't know. Some people just have nicknames. And I'm like, okay, well, what's his last name? And he goes, mom, I'm sure there are people who don't know my last name. I said, well, then they're not your friend and you're not their friend. Friends know each other really good and you get to meet their parents or sometimes they live alone and you get to know them really good. But he's, he latches on, he latched on to his therapist and um, we were just, when he passed away, we were just talking about what are friends, what are acquaintances and who are strangers. We were talking about that. And um, being his conservator, I had to be in the room like a fly on the wall and not participate, not say anything because I'm just the conservator, just in case he misunderstands what the therapist is trying to say. I would just say on his level, kind of like a translator with no input and he said 
guess what I did today? He's talking to the therapist and she goes, what did you do today? He goes, I tried heroin. And I'm like, inside of me was going wrong, but I couldn't say anything. And she said, so can you tell me what made you decide to try this? And she was so calm. And he said, well, because if I didn't, they would think I'm a punk. So I did it. And I was like, you know, and I'm cringing on the inside. And she goes, well, how did that make you feel? And he said, I didn't like it. And I don't think I'll do it again. I I don't, it, it just wasn't good for me. Uh, it was horrible. And the inside of me went, you know, like, I wanted to hear that. Yes. So people can be influenced because they feel different. Sure. They want to fit. Merrick wanted to fit in. He um, didn't want to feel like they were thinking of him less because he didn't do what they asked him to do. Sure. And that's, that's him. And so many people fall in that category as adults they can't say no they have difficulty keeping friends so they do whatever they can they'll buy their friends things just to say what a great friend you are yeah and not realizing that they're being taken advantage of it's so and even finding mostly mostly people who don't have challenges like he did you know it happens to others as well Yes. And that's why they call it the spectrum because you can be anywhere on that and it couldn't, it doesn't have to be prevalent. Like this was pretty, um, it was really obvious that he couldn't, um, he wanted friends. That's all he wanted. And I cried because through, I was able to get into his phone and I wanted to see his Facebook messages to see if I could figure something out. Mm -hmm. And I just started crying because I thought he just wanted friends. He would randomly talk to people and say, Hey, how are you doing? I noticed you on Facebook. Oh, get away from me. You know, in a very negative way. Um, Nasty, nasty people. Devastated him over and over and over again. Um, And there have been a couple of people that came to his funeral and they went to school with him and they said, you know, one of the things that I wish that I was nicer to him in high school. And I cried. I said, kindness is free, but high school is a place where you're, you know, people are just trying to figure themselves out and they will <clears throat> hang out in cliques. They will um, do whatever's popular. If even if it means bullying somebody that makes them popular, that's what they think. And that's what they're led to believe. And it's sad um, that he was bullied a lot. And um, one time in therapy, he said, you know what ruined my career? He calls his life his career. (laughs) Uh, What a way of putting things. He goes, you know what I want to do? You know, because they said, what do you want to do as a career? You know, for the rest of your life. So he equated that word career to the rest of my life. He said, mom, do you want to know the real reason why I don't like my hair combed? And I said, why? He said, because people can't look at me they would look at my hair first and I was like that's interesting you know I never put down what he wanted I said that's interesting um so what happens when you cut your hair he goes mom when I cut my hair remember that one time I really liked the haircut by the way mom I really liked it but when I went to school this one girl said hey I like your haircut but your face and he said, mom, oh, that ruined my, my he said that ruined my whole career. And I thought that one statement, that one statement devastated him. 
and it was unbelievable oh, to so cruel children are so cruel yes um to know that it stuck it stuck with him and um people look at his pictures and say he's so handsome he's so good luck looking he didn't because of that one statement he thought he was ugly one time and if i could say anything to anybody out there don't put people down people are different it's okay to be different people are not exactly like you it's okay but don't put them down don't hurt their feelings it could devastate them for life and that would be my only thing and parents if you even catch wind that your child is being a bully straighten it out make it right make them understand that it's not okay to bully people and and call them names or ugly or even if it's not a bad thing ugly that just that term stuck with him but your face he goes what about my face it's kind of ugly you know and um yeah so he had it he had it rough he didn't like his yearbook nobody would sign it oh my goodness and when, yeah so he went through a lot he went through a lot and so um that's part of being on the spectrum this is how some individuals are living their life as adults they don't understand what's wrong they think it's them and um, some people didn't have the chance to go to therapy like Merrick did. So he understood that people could be cruel. He understood that it was okay to be different. But I keep thinking about all the people that have had no therapy and they have no idea. So they self-medicate. They think to fit in that they have to do what's popular yeah come on take this pill come on you'll feel great and you you want to fit in and a lot of people i'm finding out are on different degrees of the spectrum and they developed an addiction because of the wanting to fit in part um and this starts it I think um, what happened, I noticed it more prevalent because he was so smart. I thought, oh, he's so smart. You know, he's breezing through school. The social interaction comes at 11 and 12 when you're really interacting in middle school where you have more than one class and people are hanging out in the cafeteria. And he had difficulty. He said, nobody wants to hang out with me. They think that I'm weird. Um, nobody wants to hang out with me. I said, you know what? You are the most important person to yourself. And I would always encourage him. It's okay to be different. Talk to your teachers. They're great people, you know? And that's what he did. And um, his fifth grade teacher was also a photographer. And about a year and a half ago, she, she wasn't sure what had happened with Merrick. She knew something happened, but she was devastated when she found out what happened to him. And she said, um, I had taken photographs of pictures of Merrick and he was supposed to ask you if you wanted to buy them. And I, I was like, he never told me, <laughs> do you still have them? And when I saw these pictures, I was like, she captured him in such a way that it was like, he's so handsome. And this was, of course, after his death. He was probably about, um, she was his fifth grade teacher. And then again, in junior high, she became one of his teachers for uh, his subject. Wow. Yes. And we thought it was really strange because he was in a Spanish class. And 
did way more better in Spanish than in English. <laughs> he got a better grade. He's the only one. And I'm like, I can't explain it. And later on, as he's playing video games and he has his head headphones on, I can hear him speaking different languages. We discovered that he was fluent in Russian. Polyglot. It's called a polyglot. A polyglot latches on to language and they learn it. I don't know how they learn it. They learn it. And um, come to find out the stuff that I'm finding that I thought was art is um, their Russian writing is really different. And he would do cursive. And um, when we found out when he's wearing his headphones, I'm like, I wonder how fluent he is. And so th th there's people that live across from me that um, that are Russian. And there are some people that um, did some work on my house and they came over. I said, I need you to come over. I want to know how fluent he is in Spanish. And when he starts talking, I said, son, can you say something? And he would say this long whatever and they're like he can speak perfect Russian no accent and they said um, and I said he writes it too and he said my kids can't even write it but they can speak it and he said that's really special and I did not know how special it was. He would go out and about and he would know who's, and he would start talking to them. He gets that look because, you know, you look at him and you would not think that he speaks Spanish, uh, um, Russian. Russian. Well, the reason why I'm stumbling is because he could speak Spanish too. Same way. Wow. American Sign Language. Chelsea, when he said, tell Chelsea that I love her if anything happened to me, Chelsea didn't live near us. She lived in another state and she was teaching him sign language, which he already knew. I think he liked her a lot. So he would act like he's struggling, but she had the skill of singing in sign language in a song. And he wanted to learn how to do that. And that's what they were in the process of doing. And she was devastated when this happened. And come to find out, he was texting her two days before he died, just like he did with me. Like, I'm going to die. Someone's going to kill me. She got the same text messages as well as I did. And um, she didn't know what to do or say because Chelsea does have a hearing impairment. I couldn't just call her. Um I was like, how do I do this? And I did not know that she can read lips. So she said, I have to call you on an app that I can see what you're saying. And um, when I told her that something had happened to him, she was just devastated. She was devastated. She said he was the kindest person that, she's ever met that really wanted to know how to sing in sign language wow and uh, yeah and um it you know so th that's what happened with him and I find my strength like I said when I go to meet up with moms and I go to rallies and I bring awareness I get an inner strength I can't explain it that I feel more comfortable around moms that um, that understand. We understand each other. We went through the same different stories, but inevitably the same result of, you know, we're all devastated that, you know, some people had gotten an investigation and their problem was resolved, but it took a lot of time. So they're giving advice and I'm following advice. Matt Capaluto was a godsend to me because I learned so much from him that I was able to calm down and realize that this is a problem. This is a national problem. I thought it was just my problem right. or my neighbor that lost her kid. 
wow, this is a problem. This is bigger than I thought. And when I found out what Matt and Christine were doing uh, with drug-induced homicide through Ter Terry Almanza, who lost her daughter, Terry Almanza, her daughter, Sydney, yeah. to MDMA. It's a drug poisoning. And she ended up passing away. I thought, I'm in the right place. I'm in the right group. Yes. Um, I've been to grieving groups, and um, it does help. But I couldn't continue feeling that grief it would it would pull me backwards so to speak and it was it's hard to explain for some people it does that and some people feel better talking about them so they can get past that hard hard part I really do believe in grief uh, sessions and just talking about their kids yeah. but for me I had to do something about it I felt more productive in being there for parents and future parents that are going to go through it because nothing's being done about it. There's right. no doubt I'm meeting new moms and it's, it's growing. We can't even have a fentanyl memorial wall because it would just fill the Capitol mm -hmm. ground. It, mm -hmm. It's just, you know, we were talking about this. I was talking about this uh, to another mom she goes have you thought about you know instead of a virtual having a real wall in California and I said that would devastate politicians because they're they're not doing much about it and they don't want it outed and the more it grows the more people are going to realize that something needs to be done so back to Matt and his fight for Alexandra's law that's coming up again in March or early April. They haven't set the date yet, but a lot of people want to join in that effort because now I can talk to them about in the importance of the importance of having a proper investigation so that the district attorney has a case to prosecute. You can have a district attorney that is all gung ho about going after fentanyl dealers or people that peddle fentanyl. But how does he prosecute if there's no investigations? Right. So, Or if there are that, no judges who will keep those people behind bars so that you can wait until you get to the point to charge them, not charge them, but to bring them to trial. Yes, to bring them to a, trial. because I have a really big problem with with so many uh, judges that just let them off. Like they just let them out with no bail, with, you know, nothing. And what's that about? How do you get to a place where you're so, um, it like it doesn't affect you. You're like, oh, no big deal. We'll just let them out. Meanwhile, they've had enough product on them to devastate states worth of people like the one I always remember that really got to me was a magistrate in Allegheny County and there were three guys who were brought in with enough fentanyl amongst the three of them on them to kill half the population of Pennsylvania how do you let somebody like that go that's like asinine in my book right. so it's it's every step of the like way let them go to do what they do. They just keep doing it, you know, and um, they, they're putting profit over human beings, dollars yes. matter to them and not human lives. And um, just to get that investigation and changing the stigma of addiction to Nobody deserves to die. Even an addict, if they're asking for a Percocet, less if they asking for Xanax. Xanax doesn't kill people. There is a safe dosage for Xanax. There is no safe dosage for fentanyl. Street level fentanyl is what I'm talking about because there is a difference between a transdermal patch and fentanyl that's in the hospital and street level that's manufactured by a person that has no idea what they're doing mm -hmm. and um, they just 
are following the crowd and a lot of people are dying and there's no accountability. So that accountability has to happen if they're going to stop this from going on. Significant sentences is what I think for the street level um, peddler of fentanyl, because if there's nobody to peddle it because of the stiff, stiff sentences, is resolve some of the problem, a lot of the problem. And if they decide that they're going to do it, irregardless of someone's life, they need to get a stiff sentence to deter. It's a deterrent. Totally agree. I remember, I remember growing up and my father was in the Air Force and he had this stern eyebrow. And he said to me when I was six, I remember it. Don't cross that street. I used to run across the street like it was nobody's business. And um, he just laid it down to me, said, if you choose to cross that street the way you are, I'm going to spank you and I'm going to spank you good. Or you can listen to me and you'll be okay. So I, I was warned, just like Alexandra's law is a warning. If you continue to do what you're doing, there's consequences. And I because I was given that ultimatum, I thought, you know what? I don't want to face those consequences. My dad was a big guy and I was only six years old and I, there was no way I want, I saw my brother and sister get spanked and I was rarely, I got, you know, talked to and I was, I was in tears because I thought I was going to get a spanking. So that deterrent and that warning could deter a lot of people from from even passing it off to a friend right. because, and, and there's good Samaritan laws that cover them. If you, if, if you call 911, you are not going to be held um, responsible unless through an investigation, they find out that you are a dealer. Of course, that's a different statute. You know, that's a different law separate from the good Samaritan law, but um but if they're doing it for profit, it'll everything goes through an investigation. And Alexandra's law, it doesn't even incarcerate. It just warns them. They're already in drug court for something else. They're already been pulled in for a drug offense. And they're given this warning for the next time. It's not even for this current time. It's in the future if you choose to keep doing what you're doing and choosing to give people drugs or sell them or peddle them or hand them off for free and they die as a result of the drugs that you possess and it's found out that they were in you know the chain of custody was yours then you could be held accountable for homicide and um, i just and think they should that, be. Um, and they should be because yes uh, uh, and, you know what it is? And the California I state. Just, I just can't stand this tiptoeing around these people. Do you know what I mean? There are laws on yes. the books for homicide. Why aren't we yes. using those? This is what it is. You gave them a well, not only dose that. of something that you knew could kill them. And we found out that you gave it to them homicide. It's like so easy. You you gave something with the intent of them taking it and the consequences of their death. And what is homicide? The malicious act with malintent, intent to kill that person. It's not manslaughter. Right. It's not like my brakes, um, you know, my brakes failed and I came down the hill and I hit somebody. That's manslaughter. This is complete right. murder. I'm going to pause there. Next week in part three of our conversation with Merica Cole, we're going to um, talk about her advocacy work and how she helps other people in trying to find the answers and to learn more about the criminal justice system. So I hope you will join us then next Sunday. And please do subscribe, rate, like, and comment so that our videos and audios will increase in the algorithms and more people will be able to see us. It's very important that we teach society what this is all about. Thank you. Have a good week.